My name is Leah Daughtry, and I am delighted to be your moderator for this afternoon as we talk about how we harness the power of religious institutions to make change for good. For those who I have not met, I come to this work naturally. I am a fifth generation pastor in the United States, and I am also an activist uh, in engaged in community affairs in my city and in my country. I am delighted to have a wonderful panel. We've had such a good time getting to know each other, and allow me to introduce them to you. Vashti McKenzie is the first elected and consecrated bishop in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Welcome, Bishop McKenzie. Leah Pissar is the chair of the Aladdin Project. Rabbi Delphine Ovier, my French, is the rabbi at the Mouvement Juif Le Roi de France. And Father Larry is from the Pontifical Lateran University, the Catholic Church. Won't you welcome them? So as we talk about how we harness the power of religious institutions, I want to make a small distinction. We're talking about religious institutions as well as people who act out of religious conviction, uh, who take positions and who uh, take stances based on their faith and the values of their faith. So Bishop, why don't we start with you and share with us your view of the role of religious institutions and religious people in the public square, and do you think their role is similar or different to that of, religious, of, of public serving institutions? Well, there are, many, there are many different things when we talk about the role of religious institutions. One, uh, historically and traditionally, uh, that we um, use, we preach, uh, uh, theologize about what we believe God is doing now and the meaning of our sacred texts as applied to ourselves personally as well as applying to what is happening in the world. Then as religious institutions, we also provide good works. In other words, the fallout from culture and society, the people who are ill-fed, who are ill-housed, we feed the hungry, clothe the naked, we lift the fallen. And then recently you have seen religious institutions who are now trying to impact the policies that cause poverty, that cause homelessness. And so you have seen in um, the 20th century, the civil rights movement uh, that was basically uh, financed and led by religious institutions. And then lately, uh, nuclear uh, protest and other kinds of issues where people, uh, people of faith felt passionately about uh, to step outside of the confines of their religious faith and join other people to protest against these policies and institutions that cause marginalized people, marginalized culture, uh, where culture and society have said these persons are unproductive. And since we have decided that we can't take care of everyone, then we have designated these populations as populations that we will not see to. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, participated in, persons in religious life have decided not to deal with it at all. And so they have withdrawn from uh, public and community life. And so when we talk about the role of religious people as different from people who do good works in government, uh, there is a distinct difference. We do good work, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, because of our call not because we were elected by a constituency to serve in government, not because we are a mayor or a governor or a city official. Uh, our authority comes from our call and not by a, uh, an elected uh, constituency or appointed consi constituency. So our authorization comes from two different things, uh, two different entities, although we may do similar works. That's interesting. So in a sense, there's a sense of community, but also a particularity that comes from uh, being people of faith and in religious institutions and that we have our calling from two different places, but perhaps working on the same things. So in that sense where we are particular to our, the people that we serve, 
can religious institutions help to heal breaches in society or do they in fact reinforce them and encourage them? When people believe passionately about their sacred texts and their um, beliefs, their set of beliefs, then they will argue and stand with those set of beliefs. That we do not come to have our beliefs confronted when we go, we have our beliefs confirmed. And so when you have people of different opinions and different beliefs uh, and very passionate about it, uh, then there comes a sense, I'm right and you're wrong. Uh, and uh, this is my way, and if you're not my way, then it's the highway. And so that's when we have uh, breaches and breaks and wars and other kinds of things. We can begin to heal that by taking a look at the respect that we have for other beliefs, uh, our free speech, our free religion. And we can heal that by identifying our common ground. There is common ground in each of us. If we identify that common ground, agree with that, then we can stand at that point and begin to bridge our relationships from there. So that's a good segue to Leah Pisa, who chairs the Aladdin Project, because part of your work is about religious extremism. And so why don't you tell us a little bit about what Aladdin does? First of all, I'd like to say that I'm very humbled to be on uh, such a panel um, in the presence of some remarkable religious leaders. Uh, the Aladdin Project seeks to um, build bridges through knowledge and through education. And its mission is to find areas of dialogue among Jews, Christians, and Muslims. And it started 10 years ago when um, the uh, leaders of Iran were being very negationist of the Holocaust. And people realized that when um, they did research, in, namely in Iran and in other neighboring countries, about the Holocaust, they found the Protocol of the Elders of Zion, Mein Kampf, and such books, and that a lot of literature did not, was not accessible to people who were being told that the Holocaust never happened. So it started by translating books, and Frank had never been translated into Arabic or Farsi. And we have therefore translated nine books. Um, done, we are doing a series of books on the coexistence between Jews and Muslims, their shared histories in a number of countries of the um, Muslim world. We have a remarkable book coming out next year, which is an interfaith book, which is called Know the Religion of Thy Neighbor. And it's the first time that such a work has been produced where the three sections have been written by um, experts, clerics from each religion, and we're hoping to um, launch it in the Vatican. So the, um, the idea is to counter extremism and the instrumentalizing of religion for political ends, starting with the Holocaust, but not as a dry history lesson, um, as something very, very contemporary. Um, as a warning for every people that is today under threat. And there's a lot of ugly stuff happening throughout the world. And you'll forgive me for being um, a little political. I know I can here. But a lot of what's happening in the United States today um, upsets me deeply. And other communities are under attack. And I feel and what I guess I need to say is that uh, my father was one of the youngest survivors of Auschwitz, of Dachau, of Majdanek, and of, um, of other such hideous places, um, that I feel a mission, a duty, to be vigilant and to try to teach and, um, and share the lessons of the greatest man-made catastrophe ever perpetrated by man against man to do our best so that it doesn't happen uh, to others. And in the work that you do, what have been some of the major obstacles that you've encountered, or have you encountered any? Yeah, <laughs> have we encountered any? Of course. The main obstacle is, I'd say, one of credibility. This was started as a Jewish initiative. It came out of the, um, the foundation for the memory of the Shoah and to really 
launch this dialogue. So, you know, people can say, what are a bunch of Jews trying to, uh, why are they trying to do this? We are blocked in Iran as um, a, um, an, an extreme example of uh, Zionist propaganda, which uh, we, many of us wear as a badge of honor. Um, and I'm going to tell you why we're doing this, uh, despite these obstacles, or because of these obstacles. Because, as I just said, we're all in this together, people of all faiths. And I find that the moderates of all faiths often have more in common than the moderates and the extremes. And um, therefore, I see it as a deeply common plight. Um, there is a notion that my father ingrained in me very, very deeply since childhood, uh, which has sort of become my mantra for the uh, Aladdin Project. There's no such thing as hereditary enemies. Peace has been made among peoples, among communities that were once deeply, deeply opposed, and they live together. So this idea that, that we are doomed um, to have tensions, I don't buy into, and I plan to, to, um, to hammer away at that. As I said, teaching the Holocaust, which is the key to understanding the roots of today's hatred, whatever it be, um, and um, again, I feel a very, very personal duty and to teach the lessons of the Shoah and to think differently uh, against today's political backdrop in the United States where I am ashamed of what's happening. I'm ashamed of a country where there is talk of creating a Muslim registry, where there are travel bans, where the residents of Puerto Rico are treated differently after they suffer a natural catastrophe than those of Texas, Florida, or elsewhere. There's a silver lining in this, which is that I am sensing a very great solidarity. And when I speak of Aladdin and of other things, and when I express this concern, Aladdin is something very new for me. Uh, the reactions I get are heartening and um, make me believe that we can have faith in the inherent goodness of humanity and that there is work to do. So yes, there are obstacles, but that means that we're, that we're on a productive course. If there were no obstacles and no tensions, we, we wouldn't be working in the right place. So let's pivot to you, uh, Father Larray. Uh, Leah talked about the work that Aladdin does in terms of basic education, publishing books to make sure the public's informed about um, history, facts. Some would argue that that's the role of government, that the government should be doing that. And yet they've had to create this organization that would address those challenges. The Catholic Church is very well known for its uh, stepping into, some might say, the role of government to help serve the needy, the less fortunate. Can you talk some about why the church does that and, and what kind of obstacles or challenges you've seen in the work? Certainly, let me just uh, express my gratitude for the organizers for inviting me here. Uh, there aren't too many Catholic priests in, in the women's forum. I think there's just one. And I met uh, <clears throat> Chiara in Rome, and uh, two years ago I met Maurice Levy, and we've collaborated on several projects, one in the Vatican uh, last November. So uh, I think it was a bold and courageous move for them to invite me, and, and I'm very appreciative also to share such an illustrious panel. The, the Catholic Church has an international organization called Caritas Internationalis, and probably the best well-known uh, unit of that is the Catholic Charities in the United States. They provide service uh, throughout the world, and the Holy Father, Pope Francis himself, is uh, very, very interested in extending their role. Just last week, he announced a new project from Caritas, which is called Share the Journey, and it's uh, specifically his own emphasis on trying to help migrants and refugees. As you know, this is something very, very close to the Holy Father's heart, as it is, I think, for uh, all religious institutions. The Catholic Church helps people who need the help, and uh, Bishop Vashti, I think, mentioned this also. This is a common ground. The church doesn't ask people if they're baptized or if they go to mass bef to, before helping them. 
If they need the help, they, they try to get it to them. As Leah mentioned, the problem is that the, um, the resources are limited compared to government agencies. So the Catholic Church allows, obviously, and supports government intervention, especially in disaster situations. Uh, Leah mentioned uh, Puerto Rico. The BBC did an article last week saying uh, hundreds of containers are uh, stuck in the port of San Juan, which represent international aid to the people after Maria, well, Irma and then Maria hit. The, um, the churches themselves, however, are getting the aid to the people. There's an example of a pastor in Chicago from one of the Assemblies of God uh, communities. They have 200 in Puerto Rico. They organized the shipment to uh, Puerto Rico, and he was uh, careful enough to hire trucks from the port to get the aid to the people. So he's beating international aid organizations at, at, at getting the need, getting the relief to the people who need it. So this, this is an example of what we would like to do also in the Catholic Church. Never take away from government institutions or other relief agencies, collaborate with them, but also realize that sometimes bureaucracy and even unfortunately corruption can halt that so that the religious leaders who are down on the ground with the people can actually uh, get aid to them better. And can you talk a bit about uh, Pope Francis uh, last year or earlier this year issued the encyclical on climate change, on ecology and climate change. And so talk about the, uh, Pope Francis's um, leadership in that particular area as the church has taken on a much more engaged uh, public role uh, around those the issues that we would call progressive. Pope Francis published a, a, a papal encyclical, which is an official Vatican document called Laudato Si, which is a uh, document about ecology and care for creation. It, it was drafted along with Cardinal Peter Turkson, who's from Ghana, and therefore who understands the impact of these ecological issues around the world. It struck some controversy because it was the first time a papal document addressed issues that were usually left for a, the scientific community or the academic community, like global warming, like climate change, uh, destructive industries to creation, etc. But again, this responds to Pope Francis's desire to uh, make a difference, make a difference. Leah mentions that he's very progressive. He is. Pope Francis mentioned once uh, that he's not, a, he's not a communist, he's a Marxist. And I think that that made a lot of people raise their eyebrows. Uh, because Pope Francis, it's not a political thing for him, it's a philosophical thing, uh, placing the, the person before all other interests. He is trying to work within a capitalist system, which is not easy, as, as you know, uh, so that the dignity of each individual human being will be placed above all other interests. This is, I think, his, 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 his call to all of us. Uh, he also is interested in leaving a better world for tomorrow. He's trying to get us to think what kind of world are we leaving for our children. And this is common ground. Anyone who's concerned about the earth, about the planet, about where things are going in history, uh, are, are going to be with him in, in this struggle. Well, since we're at the Women's Forum, let's talk about the role of women in religious institutions. And so, Rabbi, um, it's without a doubt, we all know that women are uh, the majority in many religious uh, communities of faith, and they tend to be more active in their communities of faith, and yet, uh, they are often underrepresented or their voices are muted in leadership. So what can, how do you respond to that? What can you share with us about that issue? Well, you're, you're raising a very interesting paradox about women's place in our religious institutions. The paradox is that women are both insiders and outsiders of our religious institutions. They are insiders, as you said, because they are religious uh, leaders, members, 
organizers, enablers in our congregations, but they are definitely outsiders because in most, in many institutions, they don't have access to leadership and not to religious leadership. And also philosophically, they're often outsiders because they represent the other with a big O in many theologies or religious thought. The outsider of the system, the margin or the marginalized, as you addressed before, versus the masculine core or the masculine center. So I'm sure you are familiar with another discourse that we often hear in religious institutions that we could call the apologetical discourse that claims precisely the opposite, that says that no, women are the core, they are at the center, they are responsible for transmission, they are spiritually more elevated or they are naturally more spiritual. But this type of apologetical discourse that we all know in all our religions actually is always a, a kind of elegant prelude or formulation of alienation or a way to very nicely and elegantly enclose women in traditional roles uh, or to ensure that they remain um, in specific domains of being helpers or secondary agents. When I think about the role of women in religious institutions, always pops to my mind a picture, a drawing, a very funny drawing that was released in the French press a few months ago, where you could see three men, uh, a priest, a rabbi, and an imam sitting pretty much the way we sit now with their feet on a coffee table, and the coffee table was actually a woman. And, <laughs> and the legend said above, well, you see, we kind of agree upon the essentials, you know. <laughs> and um, so the legend was um, actually uh, funny because it said in a way that women often contribute involuntarily to, involuntarily to interfaith dialogue in a funny way because often all fundamentalistic voices do agree on the fact that women's voice or presence or knowledge has to be restricted or repressed. And obviously, the question of women's place in religious institutions is always a very political question because behind the simple feminist question, it raises um, the question of otherness. Do we have room for otherness and for others with a big O in our religious thoughts, in our religious lives, in our religious institutions? And this other is sometimes a woman, but it can have many other faces. You know, you could say it's, it could be the LGBT community, non-believers, people who don't practice, mixed faith, children or progressive voices of the group. And I would say fundamentalistic voices share or have in common the idea of the obsession with purity and a problem with what we call in French alterité. I don't think it, this word exists in English, alterity. I don't know. Women symbolize um, the acknowledgement that your world is transformed and fertilized by your encounter with otherness and the creation of something new in your world. And this idea of change and renewal and something new in your world is precisely what religious fundamentalism abhor or cannot stand. So I think we need to help women, desperately need to help women um, to own their religion and the key is probably, and maybe we'll get back to this later, is probably religious education, the ability to interpret texts, not simply through a filter that makes them outsiders, even when they're inside the um, institution. Um, we need to help this critical voice inside a religious institution. And this task, this task um, I think, has a lot to do with the acknowledgement that religious discourse is not only about conservatism and particularism, um, and it's always about questioning the world and the text as it is read. Can you say more about particular, particularity versus commonality? Yeah, I'll say a few more words, but I'm aware that what I'm going to say now probably applies more to France and to the French um, landscape than to America, which is a different conceptions of what can be the participation of religious uh, communities in the, um, I would say, in the, in the political discourse. So in France, since the terror attack at Charlie Hebdo, uh, the discussion keeps going around that topic. Can religious discourse be a blessing? Uh, or is it a curse? Is, it, is religious 
discourse always occurs <laughs> in the national uh, discussion, or can it be a blessing? In theory, we all know it could be a blessing, and we have examples of blessing that um, religious minds and religious institutions can be, but uh, in practice in France, there is a feeling that the religious contribution to the national discourse is always a curse, or at least it's a curse if it speaks only in the name of a community and in the name of the rights of a particular group, in the name of particularism. And this is what we call in French communautarism, like communautarism, the idea that um, individuals don't have rights, but communities have rights, and this threatens the French model of laicity, of secularism as we know it, which officially states that an individual needs to be able to think against its community, against its group of belonging, to be really free and autonomous. Uh, so the communitarism that we experience today is a kind of claim of particularism against universal values, as if the only religious discourse that I could express had to do with a request mode and not a social participation mode. What I mean, it's as if religious discourse is only about what can my, what can my community get and not what can my community contribute to. And this is really the, the question we are raising um, now, and this is where I would agree with what has been said. That's the difference between, between what religious individuals can bring versus what religious institutions can bring. Religious individuals can bring to the discussion the idea that they are the children of a tradition of an ancient wisdom and nobility, and uh, that they can recognize inside the group a plurality of voices, a diversity, a pluralism, and that, that respect the otherness that I was addressing um, before. Um, because I don't see how a society can make room for the other that religious groups represent if these religious groups themselves don't make room for otherness. So, Bishop McKenzie, how, how do you respond to that? Uh, because I think in the United States, uh, as African Americans, we are often the other and our religious traditions reflect our otherness, uh, and yet, out of our otherness, we've been able to bring change or force change. How do you see the role uh, from your perspective as an American and as the first bishop in your church, and what took so long, um, to, to, what Leah, uh, to what the rabbi is saying? Well, we're, we're twice other. Uh, we are other first by our race and then other by our gender. And even in the context of our religious faith, our religious body, um, when we walk into the room, everything changes. Uh, and it changes because we are the other. So even though we may adhere to the same belief system, we are treated as outsiders somehow, not uh, fully the recipients of the grace uh, and the love of God, yet we are created in the image of God and all of us are in the image of God. Uh, and so uh, how do we overcome uh, the particularness of, of the process to be able to find our place, uh, answer our call, and do what we believe God is calling us to do? Uh, and so uh, it means actually understanding what the call is. This is not just a decision uh, another world to conquer, something to do. Uh, we respond to it because we, are, we believe that in order for us to live out our faith relationship, this is what we have to do. Uh, our gifts do make room for us. Our gifts do make room for us. And so as you move forward, it's not that you feel as the other that you have to prove you have a right to be there. Uh, and you train and qualify and go to seminary and do all those other things. For me, I wanted to read the sacred text for myself in the religious language, in the original language. I wanted to read the Hebrew. I wanted to read uh, the Greek. I wanted to understand so that I can uh, dissect it and understand it and share it. And there's a, a whole group of women scholars who have done that for decades and decades and decades. 
Uh, but for us, uh, it's like uh, we do the work. We do the work, we do the work. And there are women not only in religious life, but in business and education and medicine who do the work, uh, but may not be valued. So even in the context of our religious faith, we find ourselves, yes, uh, you, we may um, agree to your position, but we expect you to do office housework. That's called church housework. Do you understand what I'm saying by office housework and church housework? and that somehow you less than able to come to the table uh, to do the hard work uh, that you're called to do. So how do we harness the voices of the, of the others that we represent to advance issues uh, that, that highlight or that enhance the lives of women, pay equity, uh, uh, other kinds of issues that it help the people that we serve uh, empower, be empowered. How do we use the power of the religious institutions to do that? Well, if I may, just um, dovetailing on what the rabbi mentioned is the difference between religious institutions and people who are motivated for religious reasons. And there's a big difference, uh, unfortunately, because it should, it should match, but we know it, it doesn't. Institutions are also are often flawed and, and out of date. We all know the story of Mother Teresa who uh, picked, off, picked up the dying people in the streets of Calcutta and the last words of one gentleman in, who died in her arms saying, I've lived all my life as a dog on the street, but now I am dying as an angel. And, and, and Mother Teresa is a recognized Satan in the Catholic Church and she's an inspiration for, for all of us. But uh, we wish there were more of them. So I, I think that was an excellent distinction. I think we, we need to support the people who care for others, who are compassionate, and as the Pope said the other day, tender, right? Tenderness is a big issue in, in, for the Holy Father uh, in our world trying to help those who need it. Leah, do you want, how, what are ways that uh, we as people who advance the cause of the other can heighten our voices in the public square to address issues of the people that we serve? I think by bonding together, because I keep on saying we are all in this together and we each come from, I, we're all others, everyone on this stage and I think by definition everyone in this room and beyond is, is other just as we are one. Um, so I believe that by, um, this, this common cause for human dignity and human equality. Call me naive, but it astounds me that in 2017, we even have to have this conversation. Um, it's absurd. So I maybe by just calling it out as absurd, but by showing that it's the same, um, it's really the same plight. May I just read you, there's one, one uh, very important thing that Aladdin did that I must mention, which was a trip to Auschwitz in 2011, where 200 people, it was an incredible um, um, intercultural, interreligious delegation with the highest ranking clerics from, um, from all the monotheistic religions. And the, they went there, to, I was on the trip to, um, to pray together. And um, they, you know, they were they were moved by this, by this common human pain that again we all share because at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day we're all human beings. And the Grand Mufti of Bosnia, who's a, a really remarkable man, Mustafa Seric, standing in Auschwitz, said, "I came here to see for myself the evils the evil humans can do to humans." and say that those who deny the genocides of, Aus of Auschwitz and Srebrenica are committing genocides themselves. What he meant to say is exactly that. Um, if someone tries to harm you, they're harming me. And so I would just like to make a, uh, a sort of a, of a call for unity because uh, I, I believe, again, call me naive, that we will be more powerful and that we will be heard if we all do this together, particularly today. 
Rabbi, well, I believe uh, it seems obvious to say it, but I think we need to say it, that there's a key also in the new generation and in education of the new generation. I happen to lead, and this is what I'm going to do immediately after our session. I go back to synagogue to lead a service for young children, like they're between age two and five. And a little anecdote, recently at one of those services, a little boy who comes to each children's service that I lead, um, came to me during service and he said, Rabbi, Rabbi, I just want to share with you something. I would love to be a rabbi, but I'm a boy. <laughs> and I didn't say anything. <laughs> I thought he would discover early enough. <laughs> he thinks but, he's the other. Yeah, but you know, it's, you think he really felt also that it was like a, a girl's thing, you know. <laughs> And this is how I think, I mean, typically this is how we change reality because we model something new and we just build a new world. A teaching, uh, teaching the next generation is important in making sure that they come, they come with us, that they understand the past but do not live in the past, uh, but take the wisdom from the past to create a better future so that we are the parent of our future and not just uh, uh, the result of our past. And so when you talk about the Holocaust and the Aladdin movement, uh, when we talk about enslavement in the United States and other parts of Europe, in London, in England, and other parts, uh, that's something that in this generation people are saying it didn't exist. And that persons who, uh, Africans who were enslaved in America somehow were happy and they were fed and everything was all right. It is not all right to be snatched from your country and enslaved uh, for free labor uh, to build a capitalist society. And so we cannot forget that because just as there's a movement with the Aladdin, there's also a movement within the United States and other cultures uh, to enslave people again because of their hue and their hair. And so we cannot, um, cannot forget uh, that people used sacred texts uh, to um, say that it's all right to enslave another person. It is not all right. And we cannot forget that and make sure that present generations learn that. So not only we're talking about the enslavement of Africans, but also what is happening to the Muslim community in America and in other places as you have uh, population migration from one country to the other that we do not designate new others in our community, that we treat each other with the respect and dignity that we all deserve. Wonderful. Thank you. As we close now, time flies, I'm going to ask each of you to share with us something that we can do, an action that we can take to help disrupt what is the status quo and dare to lead in this environment that we find ourselves in. So I will start with you, Father Loray, and we'll come down the line. That's such a generic, uh, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I keep, well, here from the panelists, I would say keep doing what you are doing because uh, there's, there, there, from what I'm hearing and, and also from other people in the, in the convention, they're very dedicated to the betterment of, of individuals and of society. It's, I think that that's the most important thing. Rabbi? Yeah, I would say simply make rooms around the table and in our institutions for all the faces of the others that we addressed uh, uh, today. In Judaism, I would say to this discussion takes place a lot around the text, making room, for example, for women to be real interpreters of the text. And what I noticed from my experience is that, is that when women take part in this exercise of interpretation, the entire tradition is enriched by this dialogue. I'm going to echo what the rabbi said, teach and teach your children, teach your daughters and teach your sons. And I certainly will echo, uh, echo our, our panelists, but I would also say that we need to listen to each other. We need to learn other languages, understand what makes uh, a particular faith um, sacred to them, and then participate in different cultures uh, I, I enjoy going to the Seder. We are invited to come to the Seder and enjoy that experience and celebrate our, our common ground, our common faith, the things that spring uh, from that common ground. Uh, I've been invited to many other different faiths and participate 
And it really helps to understand the other. And so that the other is no longer the other, uh, that your personhood uh, is established with other people in other faiths and other communities. And the more that we see each other as people, as all a part of the human family, it cuts down on all the other atrocities that have the possibility of happening to each other. Do not neuter, do not objectify other people because as soon as you objectify other people, then you give permission for atrocity to happen. Don't do it. We want to thank our panelists and before we close, I think I will add an action of my own. I think it is so important that we lose our comfort, whether we act as people of faith or whether we act as people of values. We often become comfortable in our own belief system. And part of the challenge in our world is because we are comfortable. So my action for you is to not be afraid to challenge to challenge the otherness when you are in other or whether there is otherness around you. Don't be afraid to speak out. Commit yourself to being someone who will challenge the comfortable and who will comfort the challenged. Thank you so much. God bless you and we will see you later this afternoon.